Hello friends and staff of the Kent Northwest Kidney Center, the finest kidney center on God's green earth. Uh, welcome to the Halloween edition of our monthly in-service. I have never done a Halloween edition before because I have never procrastinated this much on an in-service. All I can say is, thank goodness there are 31 days in October and not 30. Uh, today we'll discuss genetic causes of kidney disease. Now, strictly speaking, genetic kidney disease accounts for about 10% of cases of end-stage renal disease, although in practice, it is probably much larger than this. Um, for example, there is undoubtedly a strong genetic predispos predisposition towards diabetes, and among those who develop diabetes, a subpopulation of people tend to have higher chances of developing kidney failure. Uh, and these cases often cluster in families. We see this all the time in clinic uh, when patients come in and their mother or their uncle or siblings also have diabetic kidney disease or hypertensive kidney disease. So there's clearly a genetic predisposition towards um, both diabetes and hypertension, which account for the vast majority of dialysis cases. But today we'll talk about less common genetic causes of kidney failure. Uh, these include polycystic kidney disease, focal segment of glomerular sclerosis, IgA nephropathy, alport disease, Faber disease, tuberous sclerosis, and cystinosis. So why do we need to know about these? Well, for starters, several of our patients in our Kent dialysis unit have these problems. Uh, and I think understanding the problems that our patients have allows us to understand them better and ultimately to provide better care. For example, some of these genetic conditions can affect other organs such as hearing or vision or uh, cognition. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the first genetic condition that we're gonna discuss is polycystic kidney disease. It's the most common genetic kidney disease that we see. Um, many of you are familiar with polycystic kidney, kidney disease and most of you have taken care of patients uh, on dialysis with this condition. So <clears throat> uh, polycystic kidney disease is the most common hereditary uh, kidney disease in the United States, affecting more than 600,000 people. Uh, it is a cause of nearly uh, two percent of all cases of end-stage renal disease. It equally affects uh, men, women, and people of all uh, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, the incidence is about one in five hundred births. Uh, it's a genetic disorder, uh, essentially in which the renal tubules become structurally abnormal, um, and that results in the development and growth of multiple uh, uh, cysts within the kidney. Uh, the cysts can develop in utero, uh, during infancy or childhood or adulthood. They can continue to grow uh, for the life of the kidney. Uh, the cysts are essentially non-functional tubules. They're filled with fluids. They can be microscopic. They can be enormous in size. And essentially, the big cysts crush uh, adjacent normal tubules um, uh, so that they lose function. Uh, there are two types. The most common one is uh, autosomal dominant uh, polycystic kidney disease. That accounts for about 85% of all cases. Okay, um, <clears throat> how do you diagnose this condition? Well, usually uh, we use ultrasound. Uh, basically, ultrasound will demonstrate the presence of many cysts in both kidneys. Uh, as an aside, ultrasound um, is an imaging technique in medicine that uses sound waves to generate a picture of an object, such as a kidney. Um, a uh, <clears throat> transmitter is placed on the skin and generates a sound wave in the direction of the kidney, and then part or all of the um, sound wave pulse will be reflected back to the transmitter as an echo um, if it hits a solid object such as um, you know kidney tissue and then it will look white on the ultrasound but if the sound wave encounters uh, air or water then it can pass through without reflecting back to the transducer and so it appears black so uh, in this case uh, cysts which contain fluid uh, allow the sound waves to penetrate uh, so they don't come back to the transmitter and so they appear black on ultrasound so this is a polycystic kidney the white uh, tissue white represents the kidney tissue and these black holes are the mini cysts um, <clears throat> typically patients have enlarged kidneys, they can be huge. Uh, people uh, can look like they're nine months pregnant because they have such big kidneys. Um, oftentimes patients have a family history of kidney disease. Uh, you can do a genetic screen, although it's not often done just because of the high cost. It can cost several thousand dollars. 
Okay, uh, there are a couple of genes that can cause polycystic kidney disease. There's an abnormal gene on the chromosome 16 called PKD1, accounts for about 85% of all cases. Uh, and then there's an abnormal gene on uh, chromosome 4 called PKD2. Um, <clears throat> the abnormal gene exists in all cells of the body, so you can get cysts elsewhere, uh, like in the liver or the pancreas and other organs. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, you can also develop um, other problems outside of cysts, including uh, basically aneurysms of the aortic, of the aortic root, uh, and also you can get aneurysms of, um, in the brain called the circle of Willis. And these can rupture and basically cause blood, you know, bleeding around the brain and people could die from that. About 10% of polycystic kidney disease patients have an aneurysm in their brain. Okay, so <clears throat> there have been drugs uh, proposed to treat polycystic kidney disease, but they're not commonly used. Um, the main one is called Tolvaptin. It's about $6,000 a month or about $200 a tablet. It's FDA approved, but not available yet at pharmacies. Uh, there was a big trial that came out called the Tempo trial in 2012, which showed that Tolvaptin uh, slowed the increase in growth of the kidney and also slowed the dec decline in kidney function over a three-year period. But medication has a lot of side effects, and as I mentioned, it's crazy expensive. Um, there is another medicine that has been studied called Everolimus. It is an immunosuppressive medication used in transplant patients. And in one study, basically, we showed to slow the rate of growth uh, of the total volume of uh, uh, the polycystic kidneys, but it didn't uh, decrease the progression of renal impairment. So uh, <clears throat> that one is not used clinically. Okay, uh, the next condition we're going to talk about is called focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Um, uh, this is <clears throat> um, sort of a heterogeneous condition in which some but not all cases appear to have a genetic predisposition. Um, so who out there has ever heard of FSGS or focal glomerular sclerosis. Anyone? Okay, uh, I don't hear anyone responding, so uh, let me give you some background. Uh, FSGS is a disease uh, in which scar tissue develops in the filtering unit of the kidney called the glomerulus, and there are about one million glomeruli in each kidney. Uh, a glomerulus is a continuous capillary tube um, where the blood is filtered. If part of that capillary tube uh, is scarred or sclerosed, it does not filter normally, and then protein can leak into the urine. So one of the hallmarks of this condition early on is the presence of protein in the urine. And ultimately, this scarring <clears throat> can lead to progressive loss of kidney failure. Uh, and there are several patients in our Dallas unit have kidney failure uh, on the basis of this condition. Um, so why does it develop? Well, it uh, turns out that focal segmental glomerular sclerosis can be classified uh, <clears throat> into a number of conditions. So there's primary, secondary, and then there are genetic forms. Um, the primary uh, FSGS is basically uh, <clears throat> an idiopathic form. We don't know the cause of the condition. On the other hand, secondary FSGS, which is by far the most common, can occur secondary to many other problems. Basically, any condition that damages a kidney uh, in such a way that the kidney then uh, <clears throat> produces scar in response that can produce uh, FSGS, uh, diabetes, HIV infection, drugs, sickle cell disease, uh, among others. Okay, <clears throat> but today we're talking about the genetic form of FSGS. Uh, this is a, um, uh, <clears throat> an uncommon form of FSGS uh, caused by genetic mutation, uh, and it's suspected when several family members um, have a similar condition um, and uh, in certain populations particularly after Americans the prevalence among all patients with FSGS may be uh, so of all the people who have FSGS up to 30 percent can actually be genetic so what is the genetic abnormality that predisposes towards FSGS and why does it exist so to understand this um, we have to take a virtual trip to the plains of Africa. Okay, in Africa, um, this, the people who live there are plagued by a parasitic infection called African sleeping sickness. Uh, it kills 
uh, anywhere from 100 to 500,000 people per year. Uh, it is an insect-borne parasitic infection um, uh, of humans and other animals. It is caused by a parasite called Trypanosoma brucei, and there are two different <clears throat> types. The first one that you see there causes 98% of all cases. Um, <clears throat> both are transmitted by the bite of an infected uh, tsetse fly, uh, which is particularly common in rural areas. So this is a uh, photo of a tsetse fly, and this is a photomicrograph of the parasite uh, in the bloodstream uh, surrounded by a bunch of red blood cells. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, let's see, moving back here. <clears throat> I guess I don't have a site on the symptoms, but the symptoms essentially are uh, uh, conditions such as a headache and fevers and joint aches that typically occur one to three weeks after the bite. Uh, within a few weeks to months after that, you develop a second stage, um, which features confusion, uh, poor coordination, numbness, trouble sleeping, and then ultimately uh, the condition is fatal. Now, um, <clears throat> some Africans, interestingly, have developed a genetic mutation that confers resistance to this parasite. And the gene involved is called the APOL1 gene, and that codes for a protein called apolipoprotein 1. So apolipoprotein 1 is a protein encoded by the APOL1 gene, and it's found only in humans, uh, in African green monkeys, and in gorillas. Um, <clears throat> it is a minor component of HDL, or high-density lipoprotein, which is the so-called good cholesterol, which is synthesized in the liver. Uh, it circulates in the blood, and when it's in the blood, it actually forms a complex with other proteins to form a molecule called trypanosome lytic factor. Uh, and this complex is taken up by the parasite, and ultimately it inserts itself into the plasma membrane of the parasite and allows for the influx of sodium into the parasite. It then swells and it explodes, uh, killing it. So essentially this is part of our immune system that helps uh, fight parasites. Now, <clears throat> the APOL1 mutation um, essentially, there are two variants, and they're called G1 or G2. So these are basically abnormal APOL1 genes that have been shown to protect against uh, T. brucei. Um, <clears throat> they are particularly prevalent in areas where uh, trypanosoma brucei is endemic. Um, and for example, in uh, Nigeria, the prevalence of the G1 or G2 abnormal alleles are 40 and 8% respectively. Um, and again, the African nations uh, with high frequency of these G1, G2, APOL1 risk alleles also have large populations of the trypanosome. So it suggests that these risk alleles underwent positive selection as a defense mechanism. In other words, if you had the risk allele, you were likely to survive or not develop African sleeping status, then you would live to produce children. And if you didn't have the abnormal gene, then you would die from the infection and therefore not reproduce. Okay, <clears throat> so um, there is a good side and a bad side to this genetic variant. Uh, the good side is that one copy of the gene confers resistance to, to trypanosomes, which is wonderful. But if you have two copies, that confers an increase of non-diabetic kidney disease, uh, including what we talked about, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, um, hypertensive kidney disease, HIV-associated kidney disease. Now, many African Americans are descendants of people of West African nations, um, and the frequency of these risk alleles, G1 and G2 in African Americans, exceeds 30%. Uh, which is probably why about 1% of all African Americans will develop FSGS. And the lifetime risk of developing kidney failure requiring dialysis among African Americans is 8%. So 1 out of 12 African Americans in this country will go on to need dialysis at some point in their life, which is three times greater uh, than that among uh, descendants of uh, Europeans or sort of white Americans. Okay. 
Is this story familiar to you? <clears throat> well, it might be because the malaria parasite has also uh, caused genetic selection favoring the spread of the sickle cell gene throughout the African population. So basically, if you have one copy of the abnormal <clears throat> hemoglobin, uh, you uh, have relative resistance to malaria, but if you have two copies, you develop a condition called sickle cell anemia, and that's an inherited red blood disor disorder in which uh, there aren't enough healthy red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout the body. So red blood cells are normally round and flexible and easily move through the blood vessel, but in sickle cell anemia, the red blood cells are shaped like uh, crescent moons, uh, which can um, basically plug up blood vessels, prevent oxygen from getting to parts of the body, uh, lower, uh, resulting in um, infarction of tissues. And about 10% of African Americans have one copy of this uh, gene for this disorder. So the upshot is that our genome has been shaped by uh, lots of infections, including parasites. Okay, the next condition that we're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> may be unfamiliar to many of you, it's called Alport syndrome, although uh, most of you know at least one patient in our unit who has this condition. I have one patient um, <clears throat> who has it, and I think most of you have worked with him. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a genetic disorder affecting um, about one in five to 10,000 children. It was first identified in a British family by the physician Cecil Alport in 1927. Um, it is a disorder of connective tissue that affects several organs, including kidneys, leading to kidney failure. Uh, people can uh, develop hearing loss. Uh, they can develop vision problems. Uh, you can also have abnormal blood vessels, uh, for example, aortic dissection. Um, <clears throat> it is caused by a mutation in a gene that encodes for something called type 4 collagen. Collagen is a type of, basically it's connective tissue. Uh, and it's structural material that's needed uh, for the normal function of different parts of the body. Now, type 4 collagen happens to be found in the kidneys, the eyes, uh, and the ears. And that explains why Alport syndrome affects uh, seemingly unrelated parts of the body. 85% of the genetic animals that cause this condition are inherited in what's called an X-linked pattern uh, due to mutations in a gene called the call. 4A5 gene uh, located on the X chromosome. So uh, <clears throat> women, of course, have two X chromosomes, but men only have one X chromosome. And if there's a mother who's a carrier for this, passes the, X, the, in, the affected X chromosome onto her son, uh, he will then develop disease. So this primarily affects male offspring. Uh, there is no preventative treatment for Alport syndrome. Uh, Basically, kidney failure is uh, <clears throat> inevitable. Uh, these patients require dialysis, ultimately a kidney transplant. Uh, many of them uh, <clears throat> go on to lose hearing and either need hearing aids or cochlear implants. Uh, and uh, many of them uh, develop eye problems, for example, the need for cataract surgery. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about is called tuberous sclerosis. Uh, this is an uncommon... Uh, multi-system uh, autosomal dominant uh, genetic disease. It's first described by a French neurologist in 1880. Um, <clears throat> it causes non-cancerous tumors to grow in the brain and other vital organs. Um, uh, kidneys, heart, uh, liver, eyes, lungs, skin. Uh, prevalence is about 1 in 10,000. It is caused by one of two abnormal genes. Um, uh, one is on chromosome 9, it's called the tubular sclerosis 1 gene, and it codes for a protein called hamerton. Uh, the other one is on chromosome 16, uh, and this counts, accounts for the vast majority of the cases and codes a protein called tuberin. And these two proteins, hamerton and tuberin, uh, essentially act as tumor growth suppressors. So if you don't uh, make normal hamerton and tuberin, then the body loses the ability to suppress tumor growth and you get tumor growth. Okay, so 68% of people develop benign tumors of the kidney called angiomyolipomas, uh, which often present with blood in the urine. Uh, but you can get, you know, tumors elsewhere in the brain and can cause seizures, intellectual disability, uh, behavioral problems. You can get tumors in the skin, you can get lung disease, kidney disease, etc. Uh, prognosis is highly variable. It depends on where these tumors develop. Uh, 
but life expectancy can be normal. Okay, uh, the penultimate disease we'll talk about is Fabry disease. Uh, uh, this is, um, <clears throat> it's an uncommon condition, although <clears throat> many of you have probably cared for uh, patients with it. Uh, it's a rare genetic disease, affect many parts of the body, including kidneys, heart, and skin. Belongs to a group of conditions known as lysosomal storage diseases. First described uh, simultaneously in 1898 by Johannes Fabry, who's a German dermatologist, and William Anderson, who's an English surgeon. Sometimes it's called Fabry-Anderson disease, but uh, poor Anderson kind of gets the, the shaft on this one, and most people just refer to it as Fabry disease. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the cause is a genetic mutation uh, that leads to a deficiency of an enzyme called alpha-galactosidase A. Uh, this enzyme breaks down something called sphingolipids. Uh, and if you don't have enough of the enzyme, then sphingolipids accumulate uh, in various organs and walls of blood vessels. It's inherited in x linked manner, so it mostly affects males. We typically diagnose it with a kidney biopsy. What'll happen is a primary care doctor will notice like abnormal kidney function, protein in the urine, they'll send it to a nephrologist. We do a kidney biopsy and we make the diagnosis that way. Um, but you can also uh, do genetic testing. Um, there are <clears throat> several clinical features of this disorder. One prominent feature is pain, pain everywhere. These patients hurt all over. Um, <clears throat> they can get full body pain, they can have pain in their arms and legs, we call that acroparesthesia due to nerve damage. Uh, the sphingolipids can accumulate inside the intestines, um, uh, reducing blood supply to the intestine, causing abdominal pain. Um, most people develop, most of these patients develop kidney failure, usually by their 20s. Uh, the sphingolipids can accumulate in the heart and cause heart failure, as well as conduction abnormalities like arrhythmias. Um, interesting, you can get uh, <clears throat> the development of these things called angiokeratomas, which are tiny painless papules, most often on the trunk and, and thighs, in um, um, the groin, etc. And a lot of these patients don't sweat at all, so it's another common feature. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there is a treatment for this condition uh, called Fabrazyme. Basically, it's a, it's a synthetic enzyme. And what it does is it lowers the amount of a substance called GL3, which accumulates inside uh, blood vessels and other organs with Fabrazyme. It's given every two weeks, and it's actually very effective at um, uh, slowing progression of the disease. So we live in a wonderful era of modern medicine in which we can treat some of these genetic disorders. Okay, so the last genetic disorder we'll talk about is another lysosomal storage disease called cystinosis. Um, <clears throat> it is inherited in, in an autosomal recessive pattern um, and it's caused um, by defective clearance of cysteine, which is an amino acid from lysosomes. Essentially, <clears throat> you get this mutation in a gene that encodes for a protein called cystinosin, which is a carrier molecule, and it carries cysteine out of the lysosome into the cytoplasm. And if you don't have this protein, basically cysteine accumulates within the lysosomes. Um, <clears throat> and basically, you get intercellular accumulation of cysteine crystals all over the body. Uh, for example, you can see these crystals here in uh, in the eye. Um, <clears throat> clinical features include poor growth, so infants just are have failure to thrive. Um, even with treatment, people develop kidney failure by their 20s. Uh, you get cystine accumulation in the cornea, leading to sensitivity to light. A uh, whole, whole bunch of other symptoms, uh, muscle deterioration, blindness, difficulty swallowing, uh, diabetes, thyroid, and nervous, problem, nervous system problems. Okay, uh, but again, we live in a wonderful era in which there is treatment available. Uh, there are these cystamine eye drops uh, that dissolve the crystals in the cornea, and there's oral cystamine, which is basically prescribed to decrease uh, interlysosomal cystine accumulation. It works very well. Okay, <clears throat> uh, time for uh, the quiz, uh, which you all dread, I know. Um, <clears throat> so, question one. This is the most common genetic cause of kidney failure. And survey says, 
Polycystic kidney disease, very good. Okay, this genetic kidney disease features kidney failure and hearing loss and most often affects males. Uh, that's right, exactly. Alport syndrome, very good. Next question, deposition of crystals in the eyes and kidneys occurs in this genetic disorder. Anyone? Yep, you guessed it, cystinosis. Um, what are two clinical features of Fabry disease? Well, there are a whole bunch. We talked about these. Uh, kidney failure, of course, is always a good guess if uh, we're giving in-service uh, to a dialysis unit. Uh, neuropathic pain, heart disease, angiokeratomas, and lack of sweating. This parasitic infection likely selected for mutations that increase the risk of kidney disease among African Americans. That's right, Afri African sleeping sickness. Okay, uh, so this concludes the uh, Halloween service on genetic causes of kidney failure. I hope you enjoyed li listening and have a wonderful Halloween. Uh, signing out, your medical director, Andy Brokerow. Good night. <laughs>